and healthy. And on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, so Xavier Bertu, Marcela Carena, Marta Lozada, Fernando Quevedo, and myself, we would like to welcome you to the second Latin American Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructure, a virtual open symposium for DICAP. So uh, we originally planned to have a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop symposium in March, but uh, as you, as we are all aware, <laughs> the world changed a lot since mm -hmm. March because we we're hit by the pandemic. And uh, but the organizing committee decided to go ahead and uh, we scheduled this virtual meeting. It of course, has efficiencies, but also can bring more people to participate. Has some advantages as well. And also, we decided to spread out the program in five days to make it as, as light as possible, um, because we understand that's not easy to stare in front of a computer for many hours. So only, only, only Tuesday is going to be a little bit uh, heavier. Um, so, of course, um, the person here uh, that's very important is the person, is Thiago Podinotto, he's the IT person. If you have any problems, uh, you should uh, contact him. Um, he's the person that's putting out the uh, presentations uh, in the... Um... Now, uh, questions and discussions are essential to the symposium. And however, being an online event, uh, um, there are some guidelines that we try to follow. Um, so first, um, when you enter Zoom, please mute, mute your mic. Um, and, and if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand to ask questions, uh, especially in discussion sessions. In the short 10 minutes questions, there, uh, 10 minutes session, there will be no questions. In the discussion is the place where we should really start to uh, ask questions. There's a button to do that. If you're not uh, used to Zoom, there's a button to raise hand uh, in the, um, um, at the bottom of the participant list. Uh, and don't forget to lower your hand after asking the question, otherwise, uh, I'll be looking and also the conveners will be looking and see who has questions. We also set up a Slack channel for, uh, for this uh, symposium. And in the Slack channel, there are sessions for each of the, uh, of the there are sessions for each of the sessions of the workshop, responding to each of the sessions of the workshop. And we do recommend to use the Slack channel also to uh, write questions. I'm going to monitor for that. And then putting, um, so I'm using also the general organization channel in the Slack page and to put the general announcements um, and also links. Uh, there's also sign up sheet uh, every day. There's a sign up sheet just for us to have uh, uh, at, at least some idea of uh, who is participating in everything. So this is good. Um, everything is going to be recorded. Um, there's not, it's not going to be transmitted on live, but it's going to be recorded. Of course, we expect some glitches, um, hope nothing serious, and uh, we try to correct as we go, as we go on. And, uh, and just to mention a code of conduct, this is on, uh, all the discussions is to enhance the quality and understanding of the science. Uh, even when questions are hard and probing, we'll however insist that they will be asked and answer respect, respect and civility. We value voices of all backgrounds, accents, speeches, and volumes, both among the speakers and in the audience. Scientific claims are judged by their content and rigor, not by the uh, confidence of their performance. Um, so um, I'm sure that you'll be pleasantly surprised by the richness of the landscape in the fields of high energy physics, astroparticles, and cosmology or region that we'll be discussing during this workshop. So it's, uh, it's going to be a very uh, profitable uh, workshop. And before passing the baton to the chair of this session, I'd like to invite uh, Luciano Maiani and Fernando Quevedo, who are the chair and co-chair of the high-level strategy group of this initiative, uh, to say a few words. Um, okay. So I'll stop sharing, and then Fernando and, and Luciano, if he's here already, uh, can stop. Okay. So I will start because I don't see Luciano. But uh, well, uh, welcome everybody. Well, good morning and or good afternoon, wherever you are. I hope everybody is, is uh, healthy and taking care of yourselves. It's a uh, it's a difficult time for many of us, for all, all of us, as I said. <clears throat> but uh, it's very good that we are getting together with the, this event. That is a, a very culmination of a lot of work for uh, many people for uh, already starting already several years ago, and. Uh, we thank uh, Rogerio and everybody in ICTP Cipher for, for, for organizing it, but also uh, um, 
well, all the other organizers, which I, I think have been playing an important role, Marcela, Marta, Xavier, and so on. <clears throat> so I, I am very impressed by the response. It's very good. A lot of people have responded, first of all, to the call for the white papers, but now also I see 60 participants, and I have seen some of the names of very people from the high-level strategic group are already uh, listening. So I think it's good that, that they're already taking this activity so serious. So I'm looking forward to, to the rest of the, of the workshop and uh, wish you uh, the best and see. We well, hope we, we get something very, very positive out of this. And thank you very much. And then I'll leave it to Marcela. I'm mute. OK. OK, so again, welcome, everybody. I'm just chairing the, the first session today. And I'm, I'm really happy to do that. I'm really happy to see everybody putting a lot of effort and energy uh, to contribute um, to this uh, Latin America Strategy Forum for research infrastructure that I think will help for many years to come. Uh, so without further ado, I think we, what we will do is we have two talks before the break. Um, I will ask for uh, questions and because there are 62 participants, I, it will take me a, a second to scroll um, to see if say, anyone put the hand up. So give me a second to do that after Marta's talk. So first of all, uh, we will uh, start listening to Marta Lozada. Uh, who is one of the main organizers of this effort, as you all know, and she will talk about the status of the process and goals of the symposium. Marta. Thank you, Marcela. I'm going to share my screen um, for the presentation. So I hope everyone can see this. Yeah. So I'd like to start with a few um, uh, remarks, general framing remarks about um, this process and what is the symposium in the context of the Latin American Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, in particular, in particular dedicated to high energy cosmology and astroparticles. So the first point that I want to highlight is that I think it, it's clear to us that are participating here the benefits of developing strategies for research infrastructures. However, we need to make sure that this is also uh, communicated and, and appropriated by many other um, members of society and of course of our funding agencies. Well, some of these benefits are of clear to us and, and they are because the research infrastructures develop as hubs of knowledge, of advancing new knowledge, of nucleation centers in which many other additional positive um, consequences and benefits are, are obtained as those that are listed here. And I'm not going to go through the whole detail, but it, it is important that we recognize that it helps us in, enhance the international scientific collaborations, allows us to, you know, uh, step by step, acquire scientific leadership, build more scientific capacity, technology transfer, increase the uh, opportunities for high level STEM education and to outreach more strongly to our communities with respect to science. The, the question really is in many ways, whoops, um, which are some of the considerations that one must develop for developing, a, a, consider for developing a strategy. And um, some of the points there are related to understanding how research infrastructures can impact and benefit more when they are a real global endeavor. And our different research groups in all our countries have been participating in different research infrastructures around the globe. Enhancing international alignment, but also having more participation is beneficial as well to make these really top of the line research infrastructures. But when we are developing a strategy, the starting point generally is a mandate. And in Latin America, this has been the main issue that we didn't have really the way to, to go forward with a clear mandate. But once you have a clear mandate, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but once you have a, a clear mandate, it's very important to be able to open up to the community with a wide request for input and feedback. And part of this process that we're developing now is this uh, opening up to the community to have the detailed and specific workshops that are going to identify which are the main scientific drivers and priorities for, for our region, to be able to build a roadmap that will consider different funding scenarios. But very importantly, once again, I want to stress the, the inclusion of non-regional contributions and perspectives to developing these strategies. 
So up until now, uh, up until 2019, we've had a timeline, and I'd like to go into a little bit of this in, in detail. Um, it really all started with some brainstorming um, back when we were uh, together in Sao Paulo, a group of us uh, celebrating the fifth anniversary of ICTP SAFER. And that brought up along discussions of how we could really enhance what was the development of the research uh, infrastructures and the participation of Latin American groups in relevant research um, experiments around the world. This was followed up then in November of 2016 in the CILAFI with a, a broad discussion with the high energy physics community. As a result of that, um, we were able to identify a clear point which could be of benefit for us, which was the ministerial meeting of science and technology of, of, at the Ibero-American scale. And we knew that there was gonna be a meeting in, in 2018. Um, so during the period of 2017 and 2018, we were able to gather a two page briefs of about 18 experiments to really get a landscape of what was the activity that was going on by the, in the different uh, countries in Latin America and which were the groups that were participating in that. This helped us build the case to present then at that ministerial meeting in October, 2018. There was also a lot of work done to be able to get a seat at that ministerial meeting and, um, and present there. And um, Fernando Quevedo, then director of ICTP, was able to present on behalf of all of us at that ministerial meeting. And the important thing was the outcome of that. The outcome was a, a declaration with a mandate to develop the Latin American Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures. This was then socialized in the December of 2018, again at another CILAFI meeting. And the next steps were there, you know, decided on there and what we should do. So the next steps included having during the period of January to March 2019 national meetings at, in each one of our countries, identifications of delegates to be members of the preparatory group, and 10 Latin American countries came forward and defined which would be these delegates. This, this took us then to the um, April, May uh, 2019 workshop uh, for the Latin American Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures held again in Sao Paulo at ICTP SAFER. And this was um, where we had the first meeting of the preparatory group and we defined what would be a deadline for requesting input from the community in HECAP across Latin America with a deadline of December 2019. And we received around 40 submissions at that time. So let me just flash through a few of the, the different highlights of that timeline up to the end of 2019. So these were the, the, the experiments that we were able to document at that time. And there was no intention of putting in any type of priority to this, but really, as I said before, really trying to uh, find out what was the level of activity in these domains of physics that was going on in Latin America. So here's an example of, of the list of the experiments. Here's uh, Fernando presenting at that ministerial meeting uh, with all of us uh, helping him in the background as well. And uh, as I said, it was a very positive result when we obtained this declaration at the end of that ministerial meeting to develop the Latin American Strategy Forum for Large Scale Research Infrastructures. And this was ratified furthermore by the heads of state in the November meeting, again in Guatemala, November, 2018. So, um, what is this Latin American Strategy Forum for Research in Infrastructures? Well, it has really two main goals. The first one is to promote the establishment of this on a more, on, 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 you know, a longer time scale for it to exist and not necessarily defined only to the area of high energy physics, uh, cosmology and astroparticle physics. But at the same time, one of the other important aspects that was approved at the ministerial meeting was that there should be a pilot projects. And so the, this is a particular to HECAP this, to be able to spearhead the process of defining what would be a strategy for research infrastructures in this area. So we have some specific goals that are there to build the consensus and support of a strategy based approach for the participation and development of large scale research infrastructures projects in Latin America to really bring together the Latin American scientific communities to establish this strategic scientific forum in order to coordinate our activities, um, to set up a scientific roadmap in, roadmap in Latin America based on actual participation in large scale research infrastructures around the world and the inherent need to develop a long-term planning and funding associated to these 
um, research infrastructures that would benefit our scientific communities to be able to, um, to enable a more effective development of the research groups and, and facilitate a multilateral participation in regional and global research infrastructures with the goal of in, in increasing the impact of the, our Latin American research groups. And of course, to inform the ministerial meetings of the development, implementation and impact of this Latin American strategy. So this is kind of the main goals of what we're working on. As I said before, there were national meetings, and this is an example of a meeting in February 2019 in Argentina, in which they tried to define their own process at the national scale. And we'll he hear a bit more about this in the section on national roadmaps in different countries. Um, this was the, the Latin American uh, workshop in, in Sao Paulo last year, um, in which we also had participation of members of the Global Research Council who are funding agencies from Latin American countries that were present there, and we've kept close ties with them to be able to inform this um, process. As a result of this first uh, preparatory group meeting that we held uh, last year in 2019, the timeline and procedure to open the call to the community for white papers was de developed and the deadline was, as I said before, December 2019. In addition, it was decided to include non-regional members in the preparatory group, and so four additional members were invited. Um, uh, the chair and co-chair of the preparatory group were defined for a term of one plus one year, also to establish the high-level strategy group, and the chair and the co-chair, Luciano Mayani and Fernando Quevedo, were defined, and other members were going to be defined on a two-month scale by nominations until July 1st, 2019. I will show the results of that. And um, then the next preparatory group meeting would take place in March of 2020. So here are the members of the preparatory group uh, from each one of the countries that are participating. Um, and uh, I really need to thank all of them for being so active and developing. And you'll see through the plenary talks throughout this week, the work that they've been doing in each one of the subtopics. So we have a series of subtopics and there's a cross of nationalities of, as conveners of these uh, subtopics. And I think that it's very exciting to see the real enhanced uh, results of the landscape analysis that they will be showing in, the, in each one of these presentations. The high level strategy group members is composed of three different subgroups. We have from first subgroup is the prominent scientists of the region and from around the world. The second group is directors of international research institutions that are located in Latin America. And the third, of course, is the representatives of the research councils or funding agencies uh, from Latin America. Um, so here are the members of the high-level strategy group with, as I mentioned before, the chair and the co-chair, co Luciano and Fernando. In the group of scientists, we have, again, representations from all of these uh, countries or regions in the world. And of course, in, on the column on the right, you can see the uh, institute directors that are also participating in this um, strategy, high-level strategy group. Um, I also want to highlight um, one thing, one aspect of having started this process, um, then in the Granada Symposium that was part of the European strategy process, um, Yankee Kim was invited to make an update a presentation on, on, the, on the Americas. And she asked us for input and recognized what has been going on in our region. And one of the slides that she showed was these mapping of the scientific drivers for the US, for Canada, and for Latin America. And this was just based on the work that we have developed until, you know, right up to the Granada workshop, and we were able to show what was what were some of the drivers that were pushing Latin America at the time. I think that these are this is one of the main things that's going to come out of this process that we are still developing and which will we will identify and renew, which will be these scientific drivers. Um, and so another thing that's important to keep in mind is this planning and executing of these strategic plans. And so I've adapted this as well from uh, Yonke's slides in which she was showing what was the European strategy and its execution, the US, uh, the Canada, and then Europe was again starting. And as you, I think the two main points that um, I want to highlight is the recent update to the European strategy that was approved by the Stern, Stern Council just a few days ago at the end of June. 
and the US um, starting its new uh, snow mass process uh, that will be ongoing uh, uh, receiving in input until um, July of 2021. So what is um, where we're at right now in our Latin American uh, planning, we're at this open symposium. The main goal is to have this very open discussions of the scientific drivers and initiatives in HECAP that are of particular relevance to us in Latin America. Um, and based on the input that was provided on, by the white papers, we'll have a discussion organized around the topics that are listed on the slide. And we will also be able to inform the conveners of each of these sub, uh, subtopics for, with necessary input in the discussions that we'll be having for the physics briefing book. So, the timeline for the rest of 2020 is that by the end of August, we'll have the chapter contributions from each of the convening groups uh, for the physics briefing book. Um, after editing, it will be available to the high level strategy group. Then um, by the end of September, we hope to have the first version of the strategy document. Uh, by the middle of October, the full feedback by the preparatory group to the strategy document. Um, then this will be sent on to the high level strategy group for initial feedback. Hopefully we will be able to set up a meeting as well to have a discussion on the presentation of that document jointly with the high level strategy group and the preparatory group. Um, we would hope to have uh, feedback from the high level strategy group about a month later and um, then submit a final version of this strategy document um, around the 10th of December in a final meeting with the high level strategy group for the validation, but the date is still not defined. So here I just wanted to give a, a quick overview of where we are at, how this process has developed and uh, what we're looking forward to uh, finalize by the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for this very uh, thorough presentation of all the efforts that have been done. Of course, um, um, there is a few minutes uh, for those who would like to ask a question to Marta. Uh, please raise, raise your hand. Um, and I'm looking at the participant list. Um, so if there are questions about, there are things that of course need to be decided and will be discussed during this meeting. Um, anyone has a question? I'm, I'm looking at the list of participants. Because there are 68. Um, so may, maybe, uh, Marta, you can comment. Uh, I don't see any hands, so maybe uh, you can comment about um, the strategy document that we that you mentioned that we will probably discuss uh, a bit more during this, this meeting. Yeah, so I think that um, we are at a stage in which, which uh, with the input from the white papers and what we'll be discussing in, during this symposium, we'll see a much more in-depth uh, understanding, information of the landscape in Latin America. We should be able to go through a, a process of decanting what should be the scientific priorities for the region and for developing research infrastructures in the region. And um, I think that the results that uh, have already been made in trying to condense the information of the submitted input is important. At the same time, we recognize that this is only the first time that uh, we've, we've been going through this type of the process at the Latin American scale, and it needs to be refined, it needs to be improved, it needs to be more inclusive of some activity that probably is not taken into account. Um, but I do think that uh, on a positive note, and let me just end with that, I think that this all of this effort gives us some real hope and comfort amongst um, these very dire circumstances that we're all living in. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Okay, uh, since I don't see any other uh, hands up, I hope everybody knows how to put a hand up, raise a hand in the participant list. Um, so we'll move to the next presentation, Open Questions in High Energy Physics, Astroparticle and Cosmology by Carlos Wagner, Chicago. Carlos. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if we should start uh, ahead of schedule, so we should? Okay. Uh, well, so then, I start by sharing your screen, please. Let me share my screen. 
and see if this, uh, yeah, we, we might, can you see that? Yes. So I think uh, we are three minutes ahead, but I, I think it's, yeah. fine. Okay. it's fine. Thank you. So first of all, um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present in this talk. Um, I, um, it's a difficult task to present a talk about open questions in particle physics, uh, cosmology and astrophysics. I mostly am a particle physicist, so I will talk about open questions in particle physics and the interface with cosmology. Uh, and I apologize uh, beforehand, so if I left aside uh, some of the topics that uh, you really care about, but I had to make a, a, a selection of, of topics and, and you will see how it goes. So then, uh, and then maybe in the questions and answers uh, you can uh, raise other subjects that may be of interest. For instance, flavor physics and gravitational waves that are very important to me, uh, I'm not going to talk them to them. So first, first of all, let me start uh, saying the, the obvious thing that the standard model is a extremely successful theory describing interactions between the known elementary particles. We know that it's based in the, in the gauge structure SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1 that is broken via the Higgs mechanism into the color interactions and the electromagnetic interactions. Um, and uh, basically we have tested this, uh, this theory in different ways. And let, let me just uh, review some of the important topics. First of all, uh, the test of QED, QED, as you know, is an extremely successful theory, but uh, one of the most precise tests come from the measurement of the precession uh, frequencies, uh, what are called the magnetic moments. And in particular, we test them by comparing the precession and cyclotron frequencies of uh, a charged particle moving a magnetic field. Uh, you are familiar with uh, the precession frequency of, uh, of a spin in a magnetic field. I, I give here an expression that includes the relativistic, relativistic corrections uh, by this factor gamma. Gamma is simply one over square root of uh, one minus b squared over c squared. And in the non-relativistic limit, of course, goes to one, meaning that the second term in that equation that I present uh, vanishes and you recover the, the usual expression that uh, you are familiar with, with a control by the so-called g factor that is equal to two in the direct equation. Yeah? Now, this can be compared, the precision frequency can be compared with cyclic frequency, that is a frequency that a charged particle uh, moves uh, in, a, in a magnetic field, uh, even in the absence of spin. And then uh, that is given by just uh, the same factor, QB, um, the magnetic field over M gamma. Mm -hmm. Now, when you compare both of two, what is interesting is that the difference between the cycle of frequency and the precision frequency is directly proportional to the difference of G, the G factor, and two. Mm -hmm. So times QB over M. So if G would be exactly two, we would obtain that the, that the cycle of frequency and precision frequency should be equal. Mm -hmm. And most measurements of the part of G from, from two are based on clear ways of measuring the frequency difference, uh, very extremely clear ways in a uniform uh, magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And Schwinger realized that uh, precisely the factor G minus two is modified by quantum corrections. Uh, he computed the first correction, alpha to pi, but uh, you know, this uh, is called the anomalous magnetic moment of, of the electron in particular, or the neon. And uh, today, these anomalous magnetic moments are known up to five loops. And this is an extremely uh, powerful method that uh, uh, developed uh, first analytically by people like Kinoshita. And today, do, uh, these uh, computations are done by, the help by computational methods. And uh, gives an extremely precise uh, relation between alpha, the, struct the, the fine structure constant, with uh, G minus two. And uh, to give you an idea, today we know it uh, very, very precise. And uh, this is known uh, in a part on 10 to the 12th. So it's extremely precise. precise. But it's surprising is that uh, today there exist two different precise methods to the, determine the fine structure constant, 
for the difference with respect to the one over 137 that we know. So one is precisely using G minus two, and this is shown here in the, in the red uh, little dot that appears in this, uh, in this figure. And uh, other come from atomic physics that is again by the green little dot that is amplified on, on the rectangle there. And you see that there is a small difference between the, uh, the, the determination of alpha from uh, G minus two and the one that comes from atomic physics. This difference is uh, really significant is at the two sigma level considering the, the, the precision of the methods. However, this could indicate perhaps a, a breakdown of QED then a very, so at this point, as I said, not very significant, but uh, some people have uh, speculated about the possibility that there is new physics in this difference. And uh, the, this new physics is interesting because couples directed to electrons with uh, couplings of order 10 to minus four, if it's a direct coupling, or uh, of order a loop suppressed coupling, if it is induced at a loop level. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in order to induce this uh, difference, if, if you compute it, this uh, has a different sign from the well-known G minus two difference of the muon. So you need pseudo scalars instead of scalars. But apart from that, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very interesting topic that uh, we should see how it develops. Now, more interesting is uh, the fact uh, that uh, it's well known that the muon G minus two factor departs from uh, the standard model prediction by something of order of 3.5, 3.7 sigmas. And the, the reason why the muon is interesting is because the contributions to G minus two, the muons and the electron are proportional to the mass of the fermion square. So, and the, in that case, in the case of the muon, since it's more massive, now the weak corrections that are suppressed by one over weak particle mass square. So start to be relevant. And in particular, then uh, those with corrections are of the order of the present discrepancy observed. And then you can imagine that other weak interacted particles can lead to similar contributions to G minus two. The fact is that uh, this G minus two is again determined by the difference between cyclotron and uh, precession frequencies that are depicted in this uh, little figure here. Uh, and uh, again, G minus two have been computed uh, not only in QED, but uh, by very precise measures, the hadronic corrections and, and the weak corrections that uh, the most relevant ones stop at two loops. And uh, there are still uncertainties associated with hadronic contributions, but uh, there is a consensus today based on, on different calculation and methods that indeed uh, we leads to a very precise uh, value of G minus two in the standard model that differs from the value that has been observed experimentally but a very tiny amount, a tiny amount of order 10 to minus nine, a few times 10 to minus nine, as represented here. But if you believe that there are no systematic errors and no errors in the theoretical computation, this leads to a 3.5 or 3.7 sigma uh, discrepancy. That could be a hint of new physics. Mm -hmm. Now, this new physics uh, could be in different, so it could be represented in different ways. One well known way is supersymmetry, supersymmetry, <coughs> Sorry, this to relevant contribution to the muon and anomalous magnitude moment. And to give you an idea, uh, here I represent the different uh, theoretical determinations and uh, compared to uh, that are on the left, compared to the value measure uh, at experiments. And you see this tension that exists at this point. And the supersymmetric contributions are proportional, as I said, to the, to the value of the the mass of the muon square divided by the overall mass of the supersymmetric particles that, uh, that uh, intervene in this process that are the weak interacting particles like the super partners of the, of the electron, uh, of the muon in this case, and the so-called charginos and neutralinos. And if all are of the same order, that contribution is about uh, 130 or 1.3 times 10 to minus nine times 100 CV over uh, the mass of the superseded particle squared times a, a parameter that is tangent beta that denotes the ratio of the vacuum expectation value of the two Higgs tablets that appear in this model. Now what is interesting that this tangent beta is of order 10 or 50, the values of those supersymmetric particles masses should be of order of a few hundred CV, from 200 CV to 500 CV. 
and, the, and therefore can be tested experimentally in, in the near future at the LHC, for example. And that is a, a very interesting prospect. Now, um, depends a little bit here, we are assuming that all particles are the same, depends a little bit on which particles are heavy or not. But this gives a, a, an overall picture of what we, we should expect from GMS2. And as I said, this will provide a very precise test of, uh, of uh, this, uh, of the possible contribution to these quantities uh, at the LHC. Now, uh, as you can imagine, so what could happen is that uh, you have particles that are more weakly coupled and lighter that gives to similar contributions. So actually G minus two can be, uh, there are many ways of modifying G minus two. The simplest way is just a scalar, a scalar that can be to a muon. And uh, in order to modify G minus two, uh, you see in the, in the plot on the right, you need to have a coupling to a muon that is parameterized by this uh, parameter psi, that uh, is simply the ratio of the coupling of the Higgs to a muon to, to the coupling of the Higgs to the scalar, uh, as a function of the mass of this particle. If the mass of the particle is not in the few hundred CV, but uh, instead is the few hundred MeV region, you need the uh, values of the, of the coupling that are of order of the Higgs coupling. That means the values of the coupling are for 10 to minus three. So then uh, in, in that case, you can live with lighter particles, but as, but as you see, then uh, postulating light particles that uh, couple to a muon is not so easy because there is a variety of uh, experiments that uh, you can postulate and in particular, so if uh, you assume that, this, uh, that these scalars have a universal coupling or, or the ratio of the coupling to muons to electrons go proportional to, to, to the coupling of the, the mass of the muon to the mass of the electron, then uh, in particular the Babar experiment that is an E plus E minus experiment that can produce this particle, can check it. And you see that it tests a large region of parameters uh, consistent with G minus two. And there are other experiments that are being dump experiments that, uh, oh, so Marcel asked me to use the mouse. Then, uh, well, at this point, uh, I, I need to stop sharing to use the mouse. Uh, uh, I can do it, but uh, it take me one second if, if I do that. Um, well, I don't know how to use the mouse. So I, I, uh, I let me see if I can use the mouse. I don't see the mouse. That is the problem. I, I, I move my finger, I don't see the mouse. Well, anyway, I'm, I apologize. I cannot use the mouse. But uh, you see that uh, this is constrained by many different experiments at, at low energies. And uh, I play with this uh, in, in the past. And uh, we try to also explain, uh, for instance, uh, some anomaly that appears in the case of, of uh, chaos into pions and uh, missing energy. And it turns out that uh, you can fit uh, these things, but you have to live in very extreme tiny regions of parameter space. So I believe that the, the explanation coming from high energy physics, if G minus two is real, is uh, most, more likely. Mm -hmm. So then uh, now the, what is interesting is that uh, this experimental result from G minus two will be tested soon by Fermilab. So then uh, so there is a G minus two experiment at Fermilab and it's going to report results in the, the next few months. And we will see this discrepancy of 3.7 sigma in remains. So beyond QED, so then we have QCD, and QCD is again an extremely successful theory that has been tested perturbatively and non-perturbatively. We know that the, the QCD coupling uh, becomes uh, large at low energies, and um, is the, the race is characterized by this uh, famous scale lambda QCD that is of order of 200 MeV, and that sets the, the total scale of various masses. And what is interesting is that uh, non perturbative we know that this theory works very well. So actually one can perform lattice simulations uh, of QCD. And uh, you see the comparison on the right and the figure on the right between the masses that are computed on the lattice and the masses uh, that are measured experimentally. And it's an extremely uh, fine match. So then, uh, so to the order that one can compute, this is uh, extremely good. So we have no doubt that QCD is a real theory from interaction, in my opinion. 
And this has been confirmed, of course, by the, by the cross sections that we compute in PCB uh, that uh, match perfectly well with, with the ones we measure at LHC. So far, we haven't, we haven't seen any strong discrepancy between the predictions of PCB uh, and what we see in experiment, both at the perturbative and non-perturbative level. So weak interactions can be tested mostly by experiments uh, running at the set pole and trying to see the decay products of the set particle, also the mass, the width of the particle, the asymmetries between the production of particles at the set pole in the forward and the backward direction at the left collider in particular, then uh, colliding electron and positrons. And the agreement is spectacular. So it's at the, the one per mid level. Uh, with perhaps a single exception that is the forward asymmetry of the bottom measured at left, that is uh, the one that you see that is circled there in, in the figure, that is about a three sigma discrepancy that has persisted. And uh, it's interesting because uh, um, this, if you take it by heart, this discrepancy could indicate a difference between the, the coupling of the right hand and bottom with respect to what is predicted in the standard model. And some authors uh, have worked on this. And uh, this could be indeed be indicative of the presence of new particles, like uh, new quarks that mix with the, with the bottom quark um, at, at the tree level. And that they could be tested at the LAC to have masses that are no larger than a few so, so, but beyond that, uh, we think that uh, again, the beyond the small discrepancies that we see in the normal magnetic moment and the, this uh, little discrepancy in the forward symmetry of, of the bottom. So we believe that uh, this theory is impeccable. So that it has been tested, there's nothing that really uh, indicates that there is anything beyond the standard model, at least in the case sector. What about the Higgs sector? Well, the Higgs, uh, of course, uh, has been discovered uh, recently in 2012, and the only machine that has tested the, the, the Higgs properties has been the LHC for the last years. Uh, we had some indications of, of the couplings of the, of the Higgs to the, to the weak gauge bosons uh, due to precision measurements. But overall, we know that uh, what are the predictions of the standard model with respect to the coupling of the Higgs? The, the coupling should be proportional to masses, and the, the, the constant of proportionality is simply by the expectation value of the Higgs. Mm -hmm. So, and that happened for fermions and for gauge bosons. So the gauge bosons are the gauge coupling, for the fermions, the UCA couplings. And of course, the photon and gluons are masses. Now, uh, we have tested the Higgs hypothesis. We have discovered the Higgs, of course, at the LHC, and we, we tested its hypothesis, uh, studying the LHC Higgs production in many different channels. And uh, what is interesting, of course, as you know, is that the main production channel is not via the direct coupling of the Higgs to any particle, but is at the loop level. So the, because uh, of the, uh, the fact that the LHC is, a, 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 is an hadronic machine, and the main production channel is a collection of gluons via loops uh, interacting with the, with the Higgs, these loops dominated by the top quark. That is a larger cross section than the ones that are obtained by the associated production of, for instance, of the Higgs with Higgs bosons, uh, or with the associated production of Higgs with top and bottom quarks. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, so the, there is also this interesting process of good boson fusion that uh, you have. Uh, you, you can test in this way via the combination of associated production of Higgs with weak H bosons and weak boson fusion, the coupling of the Higgs to the weak H bosons. But as I said, it's also constrained by uh, precision uh, measurements. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is that nature uh, was kind with us is that the, the, the mass of the Higgs that we observed, that is about 125 GV, is a range of masses where many decay modes are present, and therefore we can, uh, by studying the decay modes of the Higgs, we can test the coupling of the Higgs very precisely. For instance, in that figure that I present, you see the branching ratios of, of the Higgs decay to different particles, and you see that the branching ratios that, uh, that are sizable for many particles, like, like the tau particle, the boton, the, the, the weak H bosons, the gluons, even the photons, actually, the Higgs was discovered uh, via the case into photons, in spite of the fact that the branching ratio is 10 to minus 3. 
We still have to test this branch generation to set gamma, but we are, we are in the process. But uh, this will give us uh, precise information what are the couplings, the Higgs to different particles. And we have tested uh, so far this uh, proportionality between the couplings and masses that is depicted in this, in this plot on the right. And you see the different masses and the coupling to the Higgs, they, uh, they are in a straight line. The straight line is uh, governed by the back expectation by the Higgs. So then everything seems to agree with the standard model. And in the plot on the left, you see the ratios of the couplings that we measure with respect to the ones that we expect in the standard model parameters with uh, factor kappa. And although the ratio of kappa that is depicted is very large, you see that there are no deviations larger than a few tenths of a percent with respect to what you expect in the standard model. So again, the agreement uh, at the level that we can test, and again, we have to differentiate precisions of order 10 to minus three that uh, we test with gauge interactions with precision of sort of a few tenths of percent so far that we've tested Higgs interaction, but so far the, the, the agreement is very good. And of course, to go to, to further precisions and to test this model, we have to go to higher luminosity galaxy or eventually to high energy colliders. So now this mostly, as you say, what we are testing is coupling to weak gauge bosons and the third generation, or couplings induced by them, by the capital blue and the gamma that are induced by loops of tops and w's and everything works very well now we have no real idea of uh, the couplings of the higgs to the lighter generation masses and and it's interesting to try to test that so for instance we start to have and we will measure uh, the coupling to a muon that is represented here in the in the right hand in the in the left corner of the right right hand figure and you see that this is beginning to be tested, and eventually, high luminosity, we will test the coupling to muon. But it's interesting what happened to coupling to quarks. Actually, coupling to quarks, the charm quark, is very difficult to test. Actually, you, you do a, a fit to the couplings. It seems that there is a flat direction where that is represented in figure, where if you increase the simultaneous the charm coupling and all the other couplings, the fit remains the same. And the fit is broken only by the Higgs width, that is measured not by on-shell Higgs production, but off-shell Higgs production. Uh, if you analyze what will happen at the end of the late era, you can measure the charm coupling, for instance, only by a factor of two. So not tens of percent, not 10 to minus three, but of order two with respect to standard model. So it will be very interesting to, to see if we can uh, proceed with uh, experiments that uh, ha have uh, um, more precision, and that will happen for high energy colliders. For instance, a 100 TV collider will be able to, to test the charm capping in a much better way. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I, um, I have to say that there are theories indeed that uh, modify the, the, the lighter generation masses by factors that can be offered to so that we can still uh, get a surprise at the LHC in the, in the future. So now what? So we tested the standard model very well. We know that there are slight discrepancies that will be tested experimentally, but uh, what other open questions exist? Well, one open question we all know about is uh, uh, what is dark matter? Mm -hmm. And the uh, dark matter is supported by overwhelming uh, indirect evidence, starting from the rotation curves of galaxies uh, uh, or, or the, the large scale structure of the universe or the CMB or the so-called ballet cluster that I will not describe. So I think that you are all familiar with this, uh, with this experiments. But the question of what is dark matter, dark matter could be a particle of the standard model. And of course, the standard model has some particles that are neutral stable weak interactings that are uh, the neutrinos. And neutrinos are natural relics of the Big Bang. Uh, and you can plot what is the, the expected um, ratio or fraction of the of the total energy budget in neutrinos, that is this parameter omega. And you see that uh, to really explain what we observe of dark matter, we'll need the dark matter particle with masses of order 10 electron volt. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, nature has provided the neutrinos to be very light, but unfortunately, uh, they, they, don't, they don't match what you need to, to provide the, the dark matter contribution, actually. We know today that the sum of neutrino masses based on also cosmology. So it should be not larger than about 0.2 electron volts. 
and therefore they provide only a few percent of what you need to explain the dermatology. So therefore we have to go beyond the standard model. We don't know any other way of, of explaining the matter but going beyond the standard model. And that is very interesting, of course. Now, of course, uh, the problem is you have to fit one number that is the relic uh, uh, density and you have a infinite uh, amount of ways of, uh, of explaining this. And this is represented, for instance, in this plot in, in, on the right, where you see that uh, the dark matter mass could be, go to very light uh, values of order 10 to minus 20 electron volt, what is called fuzzy dark matter, then uh, cannot be lighter because it's not the Compton wavelength will exceed the, the, the ratio of masses that you need to, to, to have an effect in the structure of the galaxies. And, uh, and it up to masses that go far away from the plant scale because uh, dark matter could be primordial black holes after all. Mm -hmm. So therefore there is a, a tiny region that has been mostly studied as a, uh, as a candidate dark matter, that is the wind region. Uh, and uh, the, the region is, is good, but uh, there are other candidates and an attractive candidate that uh, has been studied that I will mention at the end of the talk if I have time, uh, are axions. That, uh, that axions uh, are particles that solve the QC, pro, the strong QC, pro, uh, the strong QC CP problem. Uh, and uh, so the, the fact that uh, there is no observed uh, nuclear and electric dipole moment and observe CP relation increasing it can be fixed by the introduction of a, of a new particle, the so called action, and that can provide a good armata candidate. But then there is this, this heart um, depicted here in the, in the talk by Stefano Profumo in the FINO workshop in May 2020, that is by WIMPS. And we have been studied because uh, they are a natural uh, relic of the Big Bang. So, you know, if you study evolution of, of the relic density, and uh, you see what is the relic density is observed today, that is represented in this figure. So today is on the right because it's low temperatures. The x-axis is the mass of the dramatic particle temperature. You see that uh, in order to get uh, the right relic density, so uh, everything will depend on the annihilation. You know, the, the dark matter can annihilate in standard oil particles, standard oil particles annihilate back into standard oil, into dark matter particles until the temperature is such that the standard oil particles cannot uh, longer produce dark matter particles. So then uh, the relative density of dark matter particles then due to annihilation start to decay exponentially until at some point the cross section of annihilation is such that is lower than the Hubble rate and the, the particles don't see each other anymore. That is the freeze out temperature. And, and, and there you get the relic density. Now, it turns out that to get the right relic density, you need particles that have roughly the weak scale masses of over 100 CV and weak scale couplings. So that suggests that dark matter is a weak interacting particle with masses of over 200 CV. And that is a very interesting suggestion. So some people have called it the wind miracle. Uh, there is no miracle, it's just uh, an observation. Of course, you can, you can vary the couplings of the masses in a proportional way to get the same answer. So, however, so what is interesting is that uh, those winds should be neutral and stable. And the, the stability can be ensured by simply postulating the, the interaction as discrete symmetry in the theory. And the typical example is SUSI. In symmetry, in SUSI, this uh, discrete symmetry is called R parity that depends on the baryon and lepton number of, of the particles and the spin. What is interesting in SUSI is that all supersymmetry particles that have not been observed have R parity equal to minus one, and all particles uh, in the standard model have R parity equal to one. So therefore, uh, if you assume that it's conserved, this is a multiplicative uh, symmetry. So then, uh, no supersymmetric particle can decay into uh, standard model particles because we violate our parity. And therefore, the light uh, supersymmetric particle is stable and is a good uh, candidate for dark matter. But now you can change supersymmetry by other theory beyond the standard model and our parity by other discrete symmetry. And you, you can tell the same story. And indeed, there are many, many theories of weak extensions of standard model weak scale that provide a dark matter candidate simply by the addition of the discrete symmetry. Now, <clears throat> if those weak exist, can be searched at colliders because they have weak interacting particles and they, they see 
can start to, to, to look for these particles. This is a representation of what the DC can do. And depending, for instance, in the supersymmetry, super partner of the W boson or the Higgs. So what are the masses that you can test? And the DC can test a very interesting range of masses. But uh, we have to go to, to larger energies to really uh, test uh, the full range of masses compatible with our matter in the theory. So for instance, of 100 kilocalorie. Now, this doesn't say that the DLC cannot provide a discovery yet of the dark matter, because to tell the truth, right now, with the 139 infrared one that have been uh, uh, collected at the DLC, actually the DLC has only tested a very tiny region of uh, the, the dark matter possibilities. Uh, here I represent, for instance, the regions that are tested in the so-called hexino vino scenario, where the lightest particles is mainly the superpartners of the Higgs, and of the hypercharged boson. And you see in the figure on the left, so the, the production, the possible production modes that are governed basically by, by the interaction with gauge bosons, the set or the W gauge boson, and then the ultimate decay of this uh, production party into the lightest particle that is observed as missing energy of the lightness. So you look for events with missing energy, and uh, the production can also be mediated by Higgs, not only gauge bosons. But look at uh, what happened right now. When 139 were we had tested a very tiny region of masses that are in the figure in the middle. And uh, in order to really test uh, the interesting region of parameter space at the LHC, we have to go to the full luminosity. So that here is a, an example in which going from low luminosity to large luminosity can give you a very large uh, advantage. Mm -hmm in the test of weak interacting particles. So I believe we are still at the beginning of the search for weak interacting particles at the LHC, and that's why it's very interesting the high, high luminosity of them. Mm -hmm. Now, dark matter cannot be searched in direct uh, detection experiment by the scattering of the, the presence of the, of the dark matter with, with nucleons, so you have, a, uh, and can be detected in many different ways by the recoiling of, of the nucleus against uh, the collision with the dark matter particles by, by light, by the emission of charge or heat. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many different experiments, but let me, let me tell you a summary of all these experimental results. And I think this is a, a very active field of research. And uh, you see, for instance, in the left, I represent what is called the spin independent cross sections mm -hmm. um, that uh, does not depend on the spin of the particle. And, and then, uh, and you see that the cross sections that are right now uh, tested are extremely tiny, of order 10 to minus 46 uh, centimeters square. So that means that uh, if the particle interacts directly with no can interact very weakly. Uh, and, and this, uh, of course, creates a tension with uh, what are called the WIMP scenario. However, le let, me, let me tell you that uh, even in, in standard theories like supersymmetry, there is a strong parameter dependence on the uh, scattering cross section. For instance, here on this figure, I represent the variation of the, of the scattering cross section of the superstructure particle of 300 CV. Uh, and depend on the Higgs mass because the interaction with nuclei are mediated in this case by Higgs particles. And it turns out that there are regions of parameter space where this interaction cross section can be very small. And actually, there is a parameter that is the Higgs mass parameter, the Higgsina mass parameter, the, the mass parameter of, of the superpartner of the Higgs, that if it is negative, essentially uh, there are no constants right now coming from uh, direct detection, from spin independent direct detection. Mm -hmm. And this is represented in the figure, but you see that uh, the current bounce is uh, the dotted uh, black dotted line. The solid line represents what will be the sensitivity from xenon one ton. Actually, in xenon one ton, we have observed, we have constrained more the parameter space. If it's not aware for the fact that if you look at the figure of the left, there is a small excess observing xenon one ton in the, in the scattering with nuclei. Uh, that uh, simply uh, is insignificant if 1.5 sigma effect, but uh, simply result in the fact that the, the, the bounds are somewhat weaker than what you expect. So then, uh, but uh, we will continue. So Sinon is upgraded now to the Anton version and we'll continue testing the dark matter hypothesis at this collider. Mm -hmm. 
So then uh, the other thing that uh, happens is that there are future plan experiments that will further test this and essentially will should test very efficiently uh, the WIMP hypothesis unless there is a very uh, coincidence that you are in a blind spot like the one represented in the circular fish. Now, now, dark matter can also be tested in the scattering with electrons. And uh, recently, a month ago, or a few weeks ago, so there was some excitement about the, the observation, also xenon one ton, of an excess in the electron recoiling against the, presumably the scattering of dark matter against them. So then, uh, and the, the interesting thing that this could be dark matter, the dark matter that you need to explain this is very different from the wind dark matter. And actually we like by absorption of the dark matter by electrons and then the, the electron getting kinetic energy. So then, uh, and, the, and the, what is interesting that in that case, the excess is observed by few keV uh, electrons and the best mass fit will be a few keV dark matter, but the couplings of dark matter to electron in that case should be of order 10 to minus 15. Both is with bosonic or vector like. So therefore that is representing in the, in the green band on the left, that is what you need to, to have that matter. The black curve is the, the present band and there is an excess, there is some evidence close to the black curve. And that is uh, that uh, KV region that, uh, that is uh, shown in the, on the left. So that is uh, very interesting, has generated a, a, a lot of excitement. There are tens of recent citations. Of course, this can still be systematic. So in particular, there is uh, one problem that beta decays occur in, with the same energies and there uh, could be a potential source of background, although the experiments uh, are checking this uh, very precisely. So this is something interesting that is observed. So now an open question from from the matter is the origin of ordinary matter. And uh, that has a different, uh, um, different nature, in the sense that uh, if you consider that matter and antimatter were produced at the beginning in equal amounts, so they, they can annihilate efficiently with each other. And if you really follow the evolution of the universe and there is no primordial difference, they, you will lead to an observation of baryon number the, at present times that should be equal to the antivariant number and much, much lower than what we observe. Actually, we know how much baryon number density there is because we can calculate it first from the amount of density that baryons provide to, to, the, to the total energy density of the universe by, by studying the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB. And you can also study it by the, by the studying nucleosynthesis that provides an idea of what is the ratio of baryons to photons in order for nucleus to, to, to give the observed numbers that we have today. And both go give a, a, a precise number of what should be the density of baryons to photons today, or for a few times 10 to minus 10. So the very tiny answer. And the, in order to produce that, you need some primordial, if you don't want the, everything to annihilate, you need some primordial difference of that order, for a one times 10 to, in 10 to the 10. And that can be produced by different processes, uh, but you need three conditions. One is baryon number violation because you, produce, you want to produce baryons more than antivariot. C and CP violation, obviously, because you want to differentiate between matter and antimatter. And on equilibrium processes in order for those processes not to erase the difference. So then, uh, so that, that, uh, that happens in the standard model. Actually, in the standard model, there are baryon number violation processes, but they are very subtle. They produced by the so-called anomalies induced by the weak interactions that violates both at the quantum level, the baryon and lepton number, but they violate it in equal amount, integer amounts, actually. And, the, and actually what, what happens is that if you study what happens with the standard model violation, why we don't see anything that, uh, that is like that in nature? Why we don't see any violation of, of baryon and lepton number? Is the fact that if you study what happens at, at, the, at zero temperature, the baryon and lepton number violating processes are suppressed by, by a, a quantity that is a so-called instant on action quantity that is of order two pi over alpha. So it's of, of order of, uh, of 
1000, so it exponential of minus 1000 extremely tiny number, right? Uh, and therefore uh, we don't see those processes. At final temperature, however, these various lepton number violating processes exist and are only Boltzmann suppressed. And actually then uh, they are Boltzmann suppressed by a quantity that, uh, that is governed by the, essentially by the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs times a, a factor, so for the, a few terms. And then um, and it turns out that if the vacuum expectation value over the temperature at some point is larger than one, this process is extremely suppressed. Instead, if it's lower than one, they, they are active. And, the, and, and the, this is interesting because the difference in the vacuum expectation value can occur at the, at the phase transition. I mean, you can start with a, with a theory where if you have no vacuum expectation value, when you lower the temperature, then uh, suddenly you get a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. That is what we think is happening. But what we don't know is that happens as a first order process of the continuous change with vacuum expectation value or a continuous change. If there is a discontinuous change, so a process of generation of variable number can occur that is called electrolytic genesis. Electrolytic genesis is because when you produce the first order phase transition, you generate bubbles. These bubbles expand. So then, um, and you know, the, the secret is the following. So value number can be generated at the, at the walls of the bubbles, but, and I will not explain exactly how, but uh, there is where the CP rating process is occur and value number violation is occurring because uh, it's not suppressed outside of the bubbles where the vacuum expectation value is zero. But the secret is once you generate the vacuum expectation value, the, the value number inside the bubble that will eventually become our immunos. So then uh, you should suppress the value number violation. You should preserve the generated value number. And for that to happen, since, since the, the processes are governed by V over T, as I told you before, we need V over T larger than one. We need this phase transition to be strongly first order, to have a jump of V over T larger than one. And the, this, unfortunately, could happen in the standard model, but does not. One can study when the first of the happens, and it turns out that you need a very light Higgs, lower than a few tenths of GV to really have first of transition of the nature that is demanding for electric chains. So therefore, if you want to, to really induce a strong first of transition with a 125 GV Higgs mass, just as in the case of our matter, you need new physics. And actually, you need new physics to generate value number if, if uh, to generate this primary difference anyway. Mm -hmm. So then uh, there are models of electrical genesis induced, and I will not talk there, to them about, but you can induce this first phase transition either thermically, so by thermal process, or maybe by barriers that already exist at zero temperature and are slightly modified by the temperature. In the first case, if you want to induce this, uh, these barriers only by thermal process, one problem that we have is that you need particles that, that uh, interact somewhat strongly to the Higgs and therefore can be tested at LHC. And there was one attractive scenario that I consumed, I'm the chairman too, many years of my life working on, uh, called the light stop scenario, that is precisely uh, constrained by LHC. And today this scenario is dead by this combination of study of Higgs processes and direct searches. So it's interesting that uh, this kind of processes that uh, that induce a barrier at thermal at the thermal level, so we we'll also be tested very efficiently at LHC, and that can happen with both uh, bosons and fermions. Models that with barriers at zero temperature are more promising because are are more difficult to test, uh, so they usually involve scalars that are more weakly coupled to the Higgs, or more difficult to produce at LHC, and uh, even. In that case, the problem is that if a barrier exists at zero temperature, then you can get stuck then, uh, in, the, in the trivial minimum. It's not so, so obvious that you will really transition uh, at the, to the physical minimum. And, uh, and that is something that uh, I'm studying in detail. So it seems that uh, in a very generic model, so the process doesn't occur. So it occurs in narrow regions of time. 
Anyway, I will not talk in detail about this. Let me just tell you that the, the signatures, obvious signatures, it's just that you produce new particles at LHC, as I told you. Uh, but another signature, if you modify the Higgs potential, a finite temperature, probably you also modify it at, at uh, zero temperature. And one sensitive modification of Higgs potential, of which today we know only the minimum, the back expectation value of the mass, the curvature, is the trilinear coupling of the Higgs. And that can be tested, for instance, in double Higgs production in, in this, uh, in these uh, figures that I presented here, the Higgs productions can be presented by, can be induced by loop processes or uh, that have or not uh, the Higgs intervening in it. And, the, and by studying the, the delicate uh, dependence of the Higgs production on the trilinear coupling, you can constrain. Now, unfortunately, the variation is, is very, very smooth. And you need the large corrections of lambda to really produce a, a large variation of the Higgs production cross section that I'm represented in this uh, plot below. The x axis is the ratio of lambda to respect to standard model or the, or the trilinear coupling induced by it. And you see uh, how the cross section varies. Unfortunately, it's very hard to, to test at the LHC, and we will need high energy colliders or very large variations of the trilinear coupling that could occur. Uh, to be able to test these uh, models in this way. You can test it in other ways. Other, other ways, and uh, in the last few minutes, then uh, yeah, I, I meant- Carlos, I mean, you, you should wrap up, please. Yeah, the other thing is CP violation. CP violation, you know, that exists in, in weak interactions. Uh, all the CP violation effects are proportional to the so-called Yerkeson invariant. And again, as uh, has happened with the strength of phase transition, there is not enough CP violation in standard model. Let me just mention one thing, is that uh, this can be measured by so-called electric dipole moments instead of neon magnetic moments, because electric dipole moments are uh, non-invariant under CP. And therefore, when you have CP violation in, in the Higgs sector induced by weak interactions, you usually induce this. And these selected dipole moments, amazing enough, can be tested experimentally. And in the standard model, are very tiny. For instance, the electric moments of the electron is of 10 to minus 37 centimeters. And the present bounce is of 10 to minus 29 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So, but new physics, if you put biogenesis, new physics. Numbers. Okay, I will stop here, but I have uh, left aside a very interesting chapter that is neutrino physics that can also be connected to biogenesis, to the generation of matter and the asymmetry, and all the question of uh, dark energy that I didn't talk about. But uh, I, I leave that for questions if you, if you have. So let me conclude then. So, part of the physics advanced through a combination of great theoretical ideas, exceptional clever experiments. The standard model, oh, has uh, non obvious properties like uh, confinement, electric symmetry, vehicle symmetry, violation of parity and time reversal, tiny neutral masses. And amazingly enough, the prediction of this complex theory agree very well with uh, what we observe experimentally. Um, many of these properties serve to define what we know of the universe, but nature seems to rely on physics to understand all both for the generation of the, of the matter and antimatter asymmetry for the generation of the matter and density. We are still at odds in finding what is the final theory or the theory beyond the standard model, but some things may exist in the matter and genesis, uh, what kind of theories we need, although not very precise things. Maybe the marriage of gravity through cosmology will provide alternative clues, and they are provided alternative clues. And uh, what is nice and very exceptional, and therefore we can contribute, in the, is that a very active experimental progress is in progress, and many ideas are generated constantly, and I hope that, that they will lead us to discover in the path for a deeper understanding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. It's very tough to chair you. Um, so, questions, uh, a couple of questions, maximum, because um, uh, you have some, some uh, um, cheers up from the audience. Um, are there any questions? If you like, please uh, just put your hand up, raise your hand. I'm trying to look. Um, 
to the participants. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, there is, uh, there is, there was one hand up. I, I miss it. I'm sorry. If anyone is trying to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. I'm looking at it. Like Marcella, if you look at the participant list, it's easier. There are three. Yeah, I am there looking. There are three hands. Nicolas okay. Bernal, Thomas okay. Sanz, and oh, Fernando okay. Quevedo. Fernando, I am, I'm, you are first in my, in my group of people, so I'm going for my... I bring you the glasses downstairs. Okay, Thank well, you, then Carlos. that's a review, Carlos. Yes, uh, uh, could you summarize in a couple of minutes the neutrino part that you didn't talk about? Yes, uh, I, I can. Uh, let, let me share the screen and because it's easier to. Uh, I think the, the neutrino part is, um, is very important. And then um, let me say a few things. I think that two open questions uh, in the physics, or many open questions, but two important. Uh, one is the possibility of neutrinos being their own antiparticle, the so-called Majorana neutrinos, because if you consider Majorana neutrinos, of course, the mass term is simply an interaction of neutrinos with themselves, that, and, and the, the neutrinos left will be the complex conjugate, essentially, you know, right, in the usual language. And th those can be tested, so far as we know, only in uh, what are called uh, neutrino and stable beta decay experiments. Mm -hmm. And those are very interesting experiments that uh, I think that uh, they are still in the making. They have provided the very interesting bounds on the, on the effective mass. The effective mass is simply, as I represented here, a combination of the, the mixing angles with the electron neutrino squared and the masses. And it represents the blue and the brown bands, and the the the, the low region represented by the blue and and, and and green bounds. And the, you see this blue bound is inverted hierarchy uh, possibility that is one of the possibilities of the arrangement of masses of the neutrinos. And the sensitivity goal of the future experiments is just at least to test this inverted hierarchy. So we will not have a full test of these models but hopefully uh, we'll soon test a, a, a more interesting region of parameter space than what is tested by now. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, this will test a region that is also complementary to the, cos the, the, the one tested by Cosmos. The other thing that I think is uh, very interesting in the positive CPU in, in the neutral sector, this is being tested right now by the possibility new, new new to new reconversion in oscillations. And there is a claim by the T2K experiment of the observation of a sizable CPR effect due to the fact that they see more uh, appearance of uh, electron neutrinos that you expect. And then, uh, and essentially, you have to have maximal CPR relation to really explain the appearance of uh, neutrino exponents of T2K. There is a somewhat uh, equivalent uh, experiment that Fermilab called NOVA that uh, is not inconsistent with T2K, but doesn't see such a strong evidence, or at least doesn't see it in, the, uh, uh, in, in both the normal and, and inverted hierarchy. But I think CPU relation, what is interesting, that will be fully tested by future experiments. First of all, they lead to an interesting uh, possibility of generating variant numbers, so-called leptogenesis, that is uh, induced by uh, heavy uh, major nanotrinos decaying in a stipulating way, that can also explain the generation of neutrino masses, that is what is interesting. So, and uh, they will be tested by future neutrino facilities like, like Dune and Hyper-K. So here uh, you see the sensitivity of stipulation and uh, essentially we'll, we'll test stipulation, uh, we'll, Dune's will test stipulation at essentially five sigma level in all the representation. That, uh, that I think is very interesting. <laughs> There are other questions on neutrino physics, like the possibility of uh, uh, sterile neutrinos that we will not talk about. Uh, so, Carlos, you have two, you yeah. have two, two questions more, but they need to be answered uh, not so long. Yes, please, yeah. Nicolas. Uh, yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Carlos, for the nice review. So, I was, I just want to ask you about um, the season excess. Do you think we should get excited, or is just tricky? Yeah, that is a very good question. 
Um, I think that uh, the Sino experiment themselves um, are worried about the possibility of beta decays uh, uh, being a source of background. Actually, if you look at the paper, you see that they also fit um, the possibility of tritium beta decays uh, contaminating the source. Um, apparently, um, for so far as uh, they know, uh, this hypothesis will not explain uh, the whole excess. And actually, if they, if they do a combination fit of tritium beta decay uh, and dark matter, apparently dark matter wins uh, and, the, and the best fit goes to zero tritium. So I don't know. To tell the truth, I think that we should wait. But uh, it's clear that uh, if, if you are a theorist, of course, you can take it as a challenge trying to explain this. Uh, but uh, I would not commit too much uh, to this. Uh, I think that uh, uh, most people believe that at the end should probably go away. Thank but you. Uh, but uh, having said Thank that, I don't, you. I don't think it might be working. Uh, Thomas? Yeah, going on the same line as, as Nicolas' question, I wanted to ask if you expect that after the, the hint at the axiom, uh, is there going to be any uh, renewed focus on the luminosity frontier? So going to other alternative, like dark sector models that have lighter mass. Thanks. Yeah, in, indeed. Uh, since um, you know that the positive explanation, for instance, you know, one ton effect is not only dark matter, could be also a fraction of dark matter, boosted dark matter, but of course, the solar axioms. And that is the, the main focus, not dark matter, but the action for using the sun. Uh, I think that there is a general shift of the interest of the community toward lighter masses and, and weaker couplings, the, uh, just as a complement of the, the test of the, uh, the wood scale and the LHC. So I think that exists, and I think it's a very uh, exciting uh, direction to explore. Uh, I have to say that the Sinon solar action uh, hypothesis is constrained by, by stellar cooling uh, effects that uh, depend on similar couplings. So, however, I'm pretty sure that there are ways to, to avoid this. Uh, and I think that uh, this, uh, what you're asking, I think that has <coughs> an interest in itself, independent, independent of any uh, uh, excess at on one ton, and that's why there are so many experiments uh, in March to, to test this hypothesis. Okay, uh, I think uh, we are really over time, so we need to cut here. Thank you, Carlos, very much for this very nice overview. And I'm sure that there would be possibilities to ask more questions if people have. So first of all, uh, there are two things I want to say before we go to the break that would be short. Uh, the first one is uh, that um, Luciano, uh, the, the chair of uh, the high level uh, strategy groups, or Luciano just joined, so I would like to give the word to Luciano to say, hi, welcome, whatever. Luciano, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for being late. I was uh, taken into another thing that I could not interrupt. And so I missed the, the, the introduction, but I wanted to, to stay there and I've been rewarded because uh, I had the opportunity to listen to Carlos, who gave a really good panorama of what's going on. In fact, I have also a question to Carlos, but uh, I, I will take that uh, after. Uh, so let me just, let me just say what I had to say at the very beginning that is a, just a few words, a few words by saying two things. First of all, I'm very glad that this meeting is taking place. It's a very good signal that the community is alive and well, and uh, in spite of all the difficulties. In fact, my thinking about that, my, my, my mind went to another circumstance, which was the end of the of the war, of the war in the 40s, etc. I was a little kid, but I can remember very well this, uh, this, uh, the atmosphere. And thinking back, it is uh, quite amazing that there were people that in the 40s, where there was Nazi occupation, etc., etc., 
wondered about Maisons and went into the black market to find the, the valves for their apparatus. These people could have been classified as really crazy, but the fact that they did it precisely at that time, they kept alive the, so to say, the flame of science, and that was an important element in the recovery after the war. In fact, a great part of Italy possibility to recover, although Italy lost the war and uh, was totally destroyed, is that there was a community of people that had the modern ideas, that wanted to push science, etc. I'm thinking of people like Edward Maldi, but many others. And that was one non-negligible element of success. So I think that we should say to our uh, governors that uh, science has to go back. Science will be a very important element for recovery. And it is very important, the work that you are doing now, to prepare, to be prepared to the, well, the end of the year. I hope that uh, the wars will have passed, but still we will be in the, in the wash. But uh, to present uh, the ideas that are on the, on the table and to tell our governors that this is an important element to start, even not only in spite of the uh, epidemic, but uh, in fact, it will be an important element to get out of it and uh, to start again a new world. So uh, this is to say that you are doing a very important uh, task. I hope you are... I'm sure you will do it very well, and we are looking forward to your result. Now, I have a question for Carlos, if I can, if I can do that. Um, you, you spoke about this um, Axiom business in, in Gran Sasso, etc. If I understand correctly, these axioms come from the sun. These are not the dark matter axioms. And, That's correct. Uh, and uh, so, it is not clear to me whether in, or in which way, suppose that the signal is there, in which way we can relate that to the dark matter. That's a question. No, no, uh, it's clear that if there are solar actions, the couplings, are, they are not dark matter. So, then, uh, so the, this, unfortunately, that, that, is a, that is a problem in the sense that uh, that will give us an idea of the existence of an action like particle, um, but unfortunately will give us no clue of uh, how to go forward. So there will be just an isolated piece of information that will not tell us uh, anything about the global picture. Of course, it will be uh, a great discovery. Or, or will be fantastic. Will, we, will, 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 with the existence yeah. of action, but okay. Yeah, I we, but we, we'll not, we'll not, unfortunately, will not give us any answer to the other questions we have. Okay. So we'll simply tell us, okay, there are solar actions that is great. So but to show great. that you are not the only ones that are at work, uh, I'm preparing a, a seminar for tomorrow for LHCB collaboration. LCB made a, an extraordinary discovery. Oh, yeah. It's a resonance of four muons that come out uh, that come out of two J Psi. That is, uh, of course, many people have suggested that that uh, should go. Um, it's most likely a tetraquark with four charm uh, particles, CC and C bar, C bar, it's a great discovery. I mean, it will open up a new way of thinking QCD and, uh, and nuclear matter. And uh, um, I hope it will continue. And uh, that is, I, I'm sure that this will be taking occupied CERN for the next years, waiting for this big jump that uh, you have uh, anticipated. And I think that thinking about uh, the, the, the infrastructure, one should take into account also this, this kind of, of research, which is taking place right now in precisely in this day. So again, have a nice job, have a nice work, good luck, and uh, we look forward to see your results in a short while. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciano. We appreciate your... Uh, 
enlightening words very much. Uh, so now uh, the, we, we really are late, so we, we lost our break, but okay, we will still have some break. But before that, um, so the break will be end in 12.15 uh, for, for Brazilian time. Uh, before that, Rogerio would like to take a picture of all of us. And for that, we need that you all get into your cameras, try to look that you are really, your face is there and not your hand or I don't know, some other parts of your body. Uh, so that, uh, and, and wait a little bit because he will have to take a few shots so that we are all there because we are at this moment 71 people. Uh, and we lost five somewhere, I, I'm sorry. I don't know who they are. So anyway, just try to um, be there and smile till Rogerio says that we are done. Yeah, it take one minute or so, just one second. 